Welcome to the Trading with Venus podcast, where we help you establish strong trading habits, generate consistent profits, and create the lifestyle you desire for yourself and your family. Now your host, Raman Gill. Hello and welcome to Trading with Venus podcast episode 12. I'm your host, Raman Gill. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome our guest, Alex Ong, to the show. Alex has traded Forex, stocks, and futures markets for a decade. Alex is a technician at heart, focusing on price action, volume, and chart analysis to form the basis of his trading ideas. His consistent results and logical approach to analyzing the markets allowed him to make the leap from retail trader to fund management, where he provides technical analysis for a private investor fund. He is the co-founder of traderscorner.co.uk, an educational website where he and his brother Nikki help retail traders improve their results and make the steps towards full-time trading. Alex is also the author of several books and various financial publications in UK, Asia, and Australia. Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us today. Uh, no problem. Thank you very much for having me. So to start things off, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Because we'd love to get to know you personally. Okay, well, I'm 33 years old. I live in the UK. I'm married to a beautiful lady and I have three wonderful children, two girls and a boy. I love my sports. Arsenal, my favorite football team, and obviously I'm addicted to the markets. So how did you first get into trading? It's it's a bit of a funny story because I've kind of been into trading my entire life, so almost since birth. I mean, my my family are all traders, so my grandfather and grandmother um, traded commodities. Then my father and my uncles took up the baton in the 80s and 90s, and obviously my brother um, and myself in the, in the last 10 years. So you could kind of say that it, it was always going to happen. In fact, I remember my first my first foray into the FX markets was when I was about seven years old. And my father and my uncle, when we were in Singapore, um, it's Singapore sort of eight hours ahead of the UK. And they would trade through the through the middle of the night. And ultimately, there were there was this one instance where they would go and have they, they went to have dinner. And they told my brother and I to basically sit in their office, in the trading office. And back then, it's sort of like these little black monitors with green writing on it. And he'd say, you know, if the number goes to here, come and get me. If the number comes to here, come and get me. So <laughs> I guess you could say we were sort of we were involved in in trading since a very early age. Sort of more recently, it was after after we finished university. So. I was a, a year or so out of university and was working so sort of like a you know a corporate job if you like my brother was still in university and we decided that working working for other people wasn't really something that we were going to be <laughs> going to be awfully good at so we had that sort of entrepreneurial spirit and particularly bearing bearing in mind sort of what what our family do so we sort of decided to to get into into trading and investing in that and sort of haven't looked back since that's excellent so you have family support which is very interesting because a lot of times when people get into trading their families don't understand this and everybody thinks it's a, it's a black hole where you just money that just disappears so it's it's great to see that you actually <laughs> had that <laughs> it was the other way around for you. It was a black hole at one point. In the beginning, it was very much a black hole that money just disappeared into. But <laughs> thankfully, we, we found our feet. And, you know, as you said, it, it is it is a good thing that our family understand it. And, you know, my wife as well, she's been very understanding over the years, because as you know, when you're a trader, and when you're an investor, it's something that you really get immersed into, isn't it? It's not something that you can kind of put down. You're always thinking about the markets you're always thinking about the next position. So yeah, it is, it's definitely good to have a, an understanding family there. Mm -hmm. it, it is, it does become a, a part of your life, the lifestyle. It's not something, yeah, like you said, you, you put put away and come home because uh, yeah. markets are open all the time. Has there been a time when you felt like you had actually failed in trading? I don't know that I could actually say that I've, I've ever, or we've ever felt like we failed in trading because, you know, we were fortunate, fortunate enough to come from a family of people that, that did invest in the market. So we were well aware that it was something that was achievable. So I don't think there was ever a part when I could say that we failed. Um, there, there have definitely been some ups and downs 
you know, along along the years, there are peaks and troughs with your equity curve as well as with your with your mental state, if you like. But I couldn't say there was ever one time when we felt like we fell because that wasn't anything that was ever an option. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so I guess if I was to look back over the years, there's probably two instances in my life when we really felt like we needed to get a grip on things. One was when we first started out, um, and that was trading news releases back sort of 10 plus years ago, when trading news re- news releases was almost like printing money, unless obviously you had a revision came out. And there was one time we were trading a non-farm payrolls, and we'd straddled the market, and the the number came out, and I think it was positive, but there was an extremely negative revision. So we basically got whipped both ways in the markets and lost quite a lot of money there. So that was probably, you know, it wasn't a failure, but it was definitely a wake up call to say you guys kind of need to reevaluate what you're doing and how you're going about things. What did you find was your biggest challenge to becoming consistently profitable and how did you overcome that challenge? I think the biggest challenge for for me anyway was dealing with drawdowns and the the distribution between wins and losses. You know that if you have a system that may let's say for example it has a 70% strike rate. Now any reasonable person would expect with a 70% strike rate over the course of 10 trades, you might have one trade that loses, two trades that wins, one trade that loses, three trades that wins, that sort of a distribution. So you'd, you'd assume that that would be the what, what your equity curve would look like, what your account would look like. So you only ever prepare yourself for taking a couple of losses in a row. You don't take into account the fact that actually, even with a 70% strike rate, you might take 100 trades and the first 30 of them why, you know, the first 30 of them are losses and they wipe you mm-hmm. out, you know, and that and that's the sort of that was what I found really, really difficult dealing with, you know, the, the distributions between the wins and the losses and the drawdowns, because, you know, everybody goes through them. And once you know, you can take two or three losing trades in a row. But when you get to a point where you take five, six or seven losing trades in a row, suddenly you start to question yourself, your methodology, you know, everything that you that you understand you, you you start to wonder whether it's right and whether you're doing the right thing so i think that was probably that's probably the biggest challenge and the way that i overcame that was ultimately by doing a hell of a lot of of back testing and a lot of of live trading just starting to get to know that that was through the live trading understanding that i could go into a drawdown and i could come back out of it which was extremely important and also through the back testing just to kind of see the distribution between wins and losses to see that you know, it was very possible to take 5, 10, 15 losing trades in a row and still come out ahead of the game at the end of the month, at the end of the quarter, at the end of the year. So, yeah, that, that would be the biggest challenge. And that would be how I would how I overcame it. Was there an aha moment? Was there a point where you thought, OK, things just clicked for you? Yeah, that there, there definitely was. And that was probably a year, mate. No, probably two years into our trading. Now, as you know, we can, as I've already said, we come from a family of traders, but we're also fortunate enough that we went to school with a lot of people that went on to trade the markets that ran hedge funds. So we had quite a good network around us. And I remember speaking to a friend of ours um, who now manages a hedge fund, but at the time was just working for one. And we're talking about the way that they approach the markets. Now, we were sort of beginning to find success, but our equity curve was still, even though it was going up, it was still quite up and down. Does that make any sense? So it wasn't a nice smooth curve all the way to the upside. There there were still quite a few peaks and definitely a few troughs there. And we're talking to him about our trading and asking, you know, how does he go about, um, how does he go about trading? What's his specific strategy um, and that type of a thing. And ultimately, you know, he he said to us that he doesn't have one specific strategy. They have a you know a multitude of different strategies. They trade a portfolio of different positions, different instruments. Um, and ultimately, that's how they that's how, how they go about making their money. So they're not looking at just one particular asset class They're not looking at, you know, some people say I only trade the euro dollar, for example, not that there's anything wrong with that. But what we found since then and over the years is that that's just a really, really hard way to make money. If you've got a portfolio of different positions and different strategies, then you're never, 
you're never dependent on just the one position or you're not you, you're not looking at just the euro dollar to do well or just your particular breakout strategy to do well you know for our for our portfolio we run day trading strategies we run position trading strategies we trade fx we trade um, equities we trade pretty much anything that moves and the benefit of that is that if any one of those go through a drawdown our whole portfolio isn't going through a drawdown at the same time you know so people think by taking more positions they're taking more risk but actually by taking more positions by trading a portfolio of strategies and a portfolio of different instruments actually what you're doing is mitigating your risk mm -hmm. so that now, that was our that was definitely the aha moment and we sort of haven't looked back since was it difficult for you to adjust to how to managing different asset classes for example was there too much information to take care of or did that just work out no i mean obviously there's you are consuming a lot more information but the you'll find that what goes on all across the planet there are there are themes that go on at any one time and you know there aren't 40 million different themes so going back into you know 2000 and sort of seven and eight it was a housing crisis everybody was cutting interest rates you were looking at quantitative easing um so there was only one theme it wasn't like we were looking at many, many different themes in, in the markets. And, and from from that perspective, it isn't that difficult to follow, you know, lots of different different positions. You know, it, it obviously it is work. It's not something that you can do with just two minutes a day. That would be ridiculous. But it's definitely worth the effort um, that we put into it because the equity curve is a hell of a lot smoother. We can sleep a lot easier at nights and um yeah, it's just psychologically easier to deal with. Tell us about your best and worst trades and what did you learn from those? Best and worst trades, that's a, that's a great question. The the worst trade probably would have been what I sort of touched upon earlier to do with one of the, you know, the failures when we're talking about failures in trading. And that was going back to when we first started out trading. And we, we'd heard about this wonderful thing called the non-farm payrolls, knew absolutely nothing about it but just knew that it moved the markets. We looked at a couple of charts, saw that you know the, it does indeed move the markets. It always goes 100 points one way or the other. Again, didn't understand what it was. And what we started off doing was something called straddling the markets. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before, that strategy. Yeah. It yeah. was, yeah, so it was quite big, you know, 10, a decade or so ago. And basically it was a way to print money, almost. What that is, you put a buy order above the market a sell order below the market and you just wait to get stopped into the into the trade whichever way the market goes now that works out really really well when the number surprises one way or the other and the revisions in agreement with that and you know we tried it over two or three months and we were literally making thousands upon thousands of pounds in, in minutes you know five or ten minutes the first time we we did it we risked about 500 pounds we made five grand and you know in just oh wow yeah so we thought <laughs> yes we found it this is it hit the jackpot yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly and and the month after same thing you know we we turned that five grand into as probably it wasn't quite the um the gain from the 500 but it's sort of five grand into about 20 or something and we thought this is all we have to do turn up you know on the first friday of every month make money walk away happy days and jobs are good and but unfortunately we it was like the third or the fourth month after doing it and as i said the the market came out and the market surprise i think it's to the upside there's a revision to the downside and we literally lost pretty much everything that we built up over the past over the first few months of our trading and that was without doubt the worst trade we've ever, we've ever taken but it was also great in the sense that it was a, it was a it was a big learning experience you know that taught us you know that got us into looking into fundamentals so understanding what actually moved the markets and it also taught us that we need to be careful that we're not invincible and we need to manage our money correctly so from a worst trade perspective that was definitely it but probably one of the best lessons we could have ever learned the best trade would have been the would have been a dollar yen trade back maybe four years ago now potentially mm -hmm. maybe a bit more but basically after the crisis the the dollar yen fell off a cliff and it hit the lows of about 78 or something like that and we kind of fundamentally believe that 
this was all wrong. This, you know, it wasn't where that particular pair should be trading for a number of reasons. So we start, we took an initial position in that dollar yen trade around 80. And we basically built into that into that position over a period of months and eventually traded out of it at about 95 for, you know, one of the, the biggest gains we've ever made in any one trade. And the the, the lesson from that was first of all to to have a fundamental idea and to trade it technically so if you've got firm fundamental groundings then wait for your technical setups and also to be to build into a position so not to just take one position because if we just made the one position we would have made some good money fair enough but nothing like what we actually ended up making from that particular position you know i think in the end that that probably netted we closed all of the positions out for an excess of about 100 grand mm, from that one won't say position because it was a number of positions but from that one trade idea if you like mm -hmm. that's a really tidy profit yes <laughs> it's not bad you can live <laughs> on that right <laughs> absolutely now can you name a person who has had a tremendous impact on you as a trader and how did this person impact your life it's probably our friend and i'd love to name his name but i think for legal reasons i probably can't do it because you know he runs a, a hedge fund now and that was the same guy that taught us about trading a portfolio of positions and a portfolio of strategies he definitely definitely had the biggest impact on our trading because Whilst we were making some money back then, he really, you know, once we adopted his approach, it really propelled us onto onto the next level. And without him, I don't think we'd be where we are today. I'm not saying we wouldn't be making money. I'm sure we would be. But our approach to trading, our ability to trade larger amounts of money is pretty much down to what we learned from him in terms of trading a portfolio of positions and strategies. Is there a particular book or resource that you also have found to be helpful? Yeah, there's one. Well, there's two books there. There's one great book, which is something called One Good Trade by a guy called Mike Bellafiore. Well, he owns a, a proprietary trading firm, SMB Capital. And that One Good Trade book is, is phenomenal. It's not going to give you a specific strategy, but to be honest, I don't read books for strategies. I've got my own approach to trading. So I much prefer reading books about traders um, and about investors so you can just kind of see how they look at the world. Because I think that's a lot more valuable than any one strategy. You know, there's a million and one different ways to make monies in the money in the market. So One Good Trade is definitely a great book. And that's, you know, in that book there, the kind of the theme is about focusing on the process of trading rather than focusing on the results. No, so don't worry about the outcome, whether it be a winner or a loser. Focus on whether you executed according to your plan, uh, whether you followed all of your rules, and hence the the name One Good Trade. The other book is one by a guy called Marty Schwartz, who was a pit trader in the 80s and 90s. And again, this is his story of trading. So he started off as an analyst, actually. Um, when, he was, and when he was about 30 years old, he kind of decided that he wanted to give trading a go and it's all about the highs and lows of his life and he was i think he was mentioned no he probably wasn't in this um market wizards book but he was mentioned by the author jack schwager at, in one of his conferences about the fact that he sort of made 25 percent consistently over his career but that being 25 percent a month so <laughs> oh wow <laughs> yeah not too bad right oh no not too bad at all. I've read the first one. I do own the first book. And I have to say that that book helped me put a process around my trading. And that's one of the thing, challenges that I was personally facing myself was I didn't have a process around it. And I went looking for a process and I didn't find, I just couldn't find one that just that worked for me. I came across uh, SMB trading. I have, I've not taken their courses, but I, I read his book and I found I could relate to a lot of, a lot of the stuff that he was talking about and I have his other book as well it's called the playbook yeah I've got that too I preferred the first one if I'm completely honest but um, I had the playbook too I was waiting on Amazon for ages for that one <laughs> okay <laughs> there was uh, the release date was like meant to be in the January and it ended up coming out in July so but I had that on my wish list for ages. But I prefer, I think the first one is the better one, if I'm honest. I don't know what you think. Actually, I, I, I like them both because I have changed my trading based on that, or at least I've changed my process. And I have integrated some of the things that he talks about into my own process now. Okay. I good. found them to be tremendously helpful. Okay, cool. Yeah. You should, if you like reading about um, other trades, you should definitely check out Pitbull. 
by Marty Schwartz. It's a fantastic book. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I will do that. Now, let's say you could do your trading journey all over again. What would you do differently? I don't know if there's anything that I would do differently because I firmly believe that all of the experiences that I had and that we had, my brother and I over the years, have helped sort of build us into the traders um, and investors that we are today. And I don't think we would be the people that we are today without any of the, the downtimes that we had because ultimately they they refocused us, they forced us to learn more to get better, to get more efficient. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure if this is an answer that you get a lot, but from my, my personal perspe perspective, I, I wouldn't trade anything. I wouldn't change anything, sorry. I'd trade everything. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't change anything because I really believe that the trading journey makes you into the, into the person that you are today, the trader that you are today, and I'm quite happy where we are today. So in terms of advice, since you've come from a family of traders, you have the network of hedge fund managers and other traders, a lot of retail traders don't have that. They hardly have anybody who's actually making money trading, let alone somebody who's actually successful at that kind of level. Yeah. Do you have any advice that you could share with retail traders? Yeah, I think one of the best piece of it, pieces of advice is really to understand, I know it's a little bit cliche, but is to really understand that there there is no magic bullet. You know, there's every everybody that we know, and as you said, we're lucky enough to know a lot of people within the industry. They all go through drawdowns, right? They all go th through periods where they make a lot of money. There's no magic bullet. There's no secret formula. You know, I'll give you an example. I was speaking to another friend of ours back five or six years ago, and he was, I won't name names again, but he was at JP Morgan Chase at the time. And we were talking about the, the dollar yen because it was a trade that, remember the trade that I was talking about earlier. And we were giving our idea on the trade in the way that we were going to trade it. And he basically, his strategy over the past year or so had been when it got to about 83, 84, I think there was a resistance point there, sell it. Sell it for a couple of hundred points with a stop, you know, 100 points above. And do that over and over again until it stops making money. And then he'll find something else to exploit in the market. You know, and what that, that, what that tells me and what that should tell, you know, the average retail trader is that there's nothing you know, weird and wonderful about what he was doing there. He'd identified a resistance point where the market hadn't gone beyond and he sold it when the market got up there. It was as simple as that. So when people think about, you know, the hedge funds and the and the and the big banks and the way that they approach the markets, you know, do they have something that the rest of the the retail traders don't know? Absolutely not. You know, are they more sophisticated in their approaches? Yeah. You know, probably the way that they approach the markets, the the fundamental analysis that they do. Yes, obviously they have all of that to their advantage, but the way that they execute isn't any different from the way you or I would execute a trade. It's not the the technical aspects of it are no different. You know, it's very simplistic because a simple approach to trading and anybody can literally make money as long as you keep yourself in check and you don't do stupid things, you know, make make mistakes and then compound on those mistakes. You know, as long as you keep your account there and you keep your account healthy, you can make money. Are there any recurring themes that you see among traders that are not making money? Yeah, I can only speak from our members' perspectives um, and our community, but the people that don't make money that, that either we teach or come to us, they all, all, all go wrong from a perspective of not being disciplined enough. So they start, when there are no trades, they start inventing trades. You know, we run, mm -hmm. a, we run a trading room and on that trading room, one of the things that people are saying that they really, that, shows them a lot about trading and teaches them a lot isn't necessarily the successful trades that I take, but the trades that I don't take. So staying out of trades that just don't make any sense. So looking at big key levels, support and resistance levels and not taking trades into those levels because, you know, your trades don't they, they don't stand any chance of making you any money. So what's the point in being in them in the first place? You know, a lot of retail traders, they come to the market and they think that they want to make money. When in actual fact, if they if you boil boil it down to you know the basics, actually what they're looking for is some sort of adrenaline rush. So yeah, the the consistent the consistent theme amongst the losing traders that we meet is obviously lack of discipline, inventing inventing trades out of out of thin air. Yeah, I find people get caught up in the excitement of trading and yeah. and they just want to be in the market. Yeah, exactly. They want something to talk to their buddy about down at like the the bar or the pub as we have in England. 
you know they <laughs> they want to be able to talk <laughs> trading they don't necessarily want to do trading mm -hmm. so yeah if somebody wanted to get in touch with you what's the best way to reach you the best way to reach us would be to go over i'll give you the email address but it'll be a little bit um you probably wouldn't remember it so the easiest way would be to go to www.traderscorner.co.uk and just fill out the contact form at the bottom of the of the page that will come directly to us. Ask us any questions you want. I mean, that's definitely the easiest way to get to us. So traderscorner.co.uk. Alex, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today and sharing all your experiences and your insights with us. We really appreciate it. No, thank you very much. It's really, it's been a pleasure. It's the first one of these I've actually done uh, in like this online. So it's pretty cool. It's a nice experience. And thank you for being my first. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Alex. Have a good day. Take care. We've been chatting with Alex Ong, who tells us about his trading journey, his background coming from a family of traders, and their approach to trading. Alex believes in having a portfolio of instruments and strategies instead of depending on a single currency or instrument. He also discusses his best and worst trades and what he learned from these. For show notes for this episode, please visit tradingwithvenus.com podcast page episode 12. And if you liked what you heard, be sure to leave us a positive review on iTunes. This will help the show rankings and allow us to bring more great content to you. Once again, thank you so very much for spending this time with me. I am very grateful for your support. Until next time, this is Raman Gill wishing you profitable trading. If you want consistency in your trading, we invite you to join our daily market analysis calls where we provide the levels to find the best entries and targets on an intraday basis. For a one-week free trial, please visit www.tradingwithvenus.com. Thanks for joining us today. With much gratitude, your show host, Raman Gill.